What's going on guys? This is Greg. You're watching part three of the nuclear attack survival skills series. And in this part, I'm going to discuss how nukes work. All right, so let's get started. Um, so the way that a nuclear bomb typically works or any type of nuclear explosion um, is you're going to have you're going to have a your detonation point, which is where the weapon is dis de detonated. And then you're going to have your mushroom cloud from the explosion. You know, there's going to be a mushroom cloud. And then all the ashes are going to be sucked into the... When there's an explosion, all the ashes are going to go up in the air. And those ashes are going to come down at some point, you know, away from the detonation point. And that's the, what they call nuclear fallout. Um, you know, just imagine like if you ever see that movie Volcano... You know, you have the volcano with uh, Tommy Lee Jones. The volcano explodes, and all of the uh, the volcanic ashes they come up in the air, and it looks like it's snowing. And um, you know, the nearby city is like it looks like it's snowing. That's that's it's kind of similar with a nuclear bomb. You know, you're gonna have the explosion from the blast where the from where the nuclear weapon is detonated. Then all the ashes are gonna go up in the air. And then they're going to settle down from the atmosphere because they're going to go up really high. And then they're going to settle down as fallout. And there's just going to be ashes that are going to be irradiated. Um, so depending on where you are in relation to the explosion of the weapon, um, you're going to have to deal with different threats, you know. Um, you're either going to have to deal with overpressure from the explosion, from the blast wave, or thermal radiation... Um, or a combination of those two, you know, or fallout. Um, so there's also two different ways that a nuclear weapon, especially if we're talking about like a missile, you know, a nuclear missile, um, or a bomb, you know, that's dropped by like a superpower, um, you know, like an ICBM or something like that. Let's say North Korea, you know, was to launch a weapon at us. There's two ways that the bomb can be detonated. There's what's called a ground burst. Uh, there's actually three ways, but uh, there's only two ways that apply to this video because we're not talking about EMPs, but okay, if we really want to go crazy, we'll say that there's three ways, okay? You have an atmospheric detonation, you have an air burst, and then you have a ground burst. Um, your atmospheric detonation is going to be, if this is, if this is the Earth here, and the atmosphere, you know, you have outer space, you know, you have the orbit, low Earth orbit. The atmospheric detonation means that the weapon is detonated, um, you know, in the atmosphere, high above the Earth, like high in the atmosphere. Um, you know, you're talking about at least 200 miles, 300 miles above the Earth. And the atmospheric detonation is typically designed to generate an electromagnetic pulse. Because... Uh, when nuclear weapons explode, they generate gamma gamma radiation, and it creates like a magnet electromagnetic pulse, which wipes out all the electronics. You know, um, that would actually be very devastating to the United States. But let's say, for instance, the other two, because we're talking about more like a nuclear situation, not an EMP. You're talking about an air burst or a ground burst. Now, an air burst, just to keep it simple. You know, the air burst means that the weapon is detonated slightly above the target in the air, you know, so it may be detonated like, you know, a few thousand feet or it could be, you know, even less than that. They call that an air burst. Um, and then there's also a ground burst, which is, let's say, if the missile is coming down, let's say you have like, you know, a city, you know, let's say like you have your skyscrapers, you know, the air burst is going to detonate somewhere up in the air. And, and the air burst has certain benefits over a ground burst and vice versa. There's reasons why you want an air burst or a ground burst. The air burst will cause more damage on a wider scale because if, it, if the bomb detonates above the city, then the blast, the blast, the overpressure from the blast and the blast wave is going to spread over a larger area and it's going to destroy more things. So, so an air burst is when you want to have um, a more generalized destruction and you want to cover a larger area like a city or like a, a military base or like a large uh, area of troops you know like a 
you know, a buildup of troops in one area, you want to wipe them all out, that's when you use an air burst. A ground burst, the missile's coming down, let's say this is the, the ground level is my hand here, and there's, you know, a city or something. Let's say, let's say underneath my hand there's a bunker. Let's say there's, you know, a presidential bunker of some, some kind. Let's say Vladimir Putin has a bunker underneath my hand, okay? And, and this is a, a peacekeeper, a peacekeeper missile that we launched, you know, and it's coming down and it's going to detonate at the ground level. And when it detonates at the ground level, it's more likely to damage the bunker and, and to damage a, a pinpointed target that they want to hit, you know. So if it's like a specific complex, like a bunker or a, uh, a base or something like that, you know, that's when a, gro a ground-based weapon is what you're going to want. Um, and the differences between those is, you know, your ground burst is going to have more fallout effects. Um, and there's also going to be more rubble to deal with. Because the, the, the ground burst, especially if we're talking about a city, if it explodes at the ground level in a city, all the buildings are going to be wiped, you know, the blast wave is going to spread through and all the buildings are going to crumble and every, people are going to get crushed under rubble. Um, <clears throat> an air burst, you may not have that rubble situation. Um, also with the ground burst, you're going to have more fallout. There's going to be more radioactive fallout because... You know, when you detonate it at the ground level, any type of organic or inorganic matter, you know, that's around the, the detonation point is going to be vaporized and turn into ashes and it's going to come up and then settle down. Um, an, air an air burst is going to have uh, less, less of those, um, you know, uh, fall. it's going to have less fallout. However, an air burst you're going to have more thermal radiation, so you're going to be burned. You can get third-degree burns, you know, very from very far away. Um, so that's something you need to know. And um, so then we'll go into the different effects, you know. So so you got your the three the three main things that you got to worry about, the three effects that you need to worry about from a nuclear attack, is you got your your overpressure or your blast wave is what they call it. That's basically the 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 pressure from the the actual explosion, the blast, you know. So think of like a grenade or like a demolitions, you know, when they're demolishing a bridge or something. They call that that's the overpressure from the explosion. A nuclear a nuclear weapon generates a massive amount of overpressure and and it covers a huge area. So imagine like demolition charges that they use to like demolish a bridge or something. A nuclear weapon is going to be like billions of billions of times stronger than like a demolition charge. So it's going to basically wipe out like a large area. Everything is going to be just vaporized and destroyed. Um, so, so you're going to have to deal with the overpressure. You know, uh, they call that like a concuss concussion, concussive force. Um, and then you're going to have to deal with thermal radiation, which is the heat. You know, after the explosion, after, as soon as the, after it detonates, the temperature is going to rise and it's going to be very hot. Uh, you know, you, you can receive within within seconds, the temperature is going to rise into thousands of degrees. It's going to melt things. Cars are going to be melted. Um, so, you know, you can get burned from a long distance away. You can also burn your eyes if you look at it. Or if you don't, you know, if you look at the explosion, obviously the light shine will blind you too. But um, if you have your eyes open and you're facing the detonation point and it's very, and the, the temperature gets hot, it can burn your eyes. So, um, you know, you got to deal with thermal radiation, which is the, you know, you can get third degree burns. Sometimes you could be like, you know, depending on the type of, uh, type of bomb that they detonate. Um, yeah, I'll show you my whiteboard here. Um, so you got your blast wave, your thermal radiation, and then you got your nuclear radiation. But, you know, with the thermal radiation, you know, you could be 10 or 20 miles away and you still may get some burns, you know, depending on the strength of the bomb, how big it is. There's a lot of factors in play. But, uh, you know, there's a good website. It's called uh, Nuke Map. I'll write it down for you. Just go on uh, Google. Just go on Google and look up Nuke Map. Just type in nuke map. Nuke map. Just type that in in the Google bar. I'll try to find it and post it in the in the description box below the link to the website. But 
what that is is it's just a nuclear detonation simulator and you can put different types of uh, nuclear weapons uh, that have been exploded already or things that are theorized to be uh, in development you know so for example you could take like you could take like the a bomb that was dropped over Hiroshima and you can detonate that over you know whatever city in in the US or you know and what it does is it shows you how far away you're going to get third degree burns it's going to show you um where the highest uh where the immediate destruction effects are and it's going to make a nice little uh like rings that's going to plot like rings on the map so you can see how far away you you would have to be to get burns how far away uh you would have to be to get you know hit by concussive forces um so check out nuke map and then the last one is nuclear radiation um so nuclear radiation there's two types you know you're going to deal with nuclear radiation that's going to be extremely high if you're close to the detonation point so if you're like let's say you're in New York City or Washington DC or LA let's say you're in downtown LA and Kim Jong Un decides to launch a nuclear weapon um Basically, if you're somewhere close to where the, let's say he detonates it over uh, Los Angeles and you're in the downtown area, chances are the, the radiation is going to be so high because that's right where the explosion is. That's where the highest radiation is. Um, you're going to get extreme, an extreme dose of radiation in a very, even in a short period of time. You're going to get either radiation sickness or you may even die. Um, or you may even just get extreme radiation burns, you know. So the two types of radiations in a nuclear bomb, a nuclear explosion, you're going to have your right where the detonation point is, which is the highest, and but, but it's also not over a large area. Um, and then you're going to have your fallout, which is weaker, um, but it's over a larger area. So like with the with the... The radiation close to the detonation point is going to be extremely high and if you're there for like even just a short period of time it's going to give you a fatal dose or a very high dose you know um but it's it's you can if you're as you move away from the detonation point using the inverse square law as i as i mentioned earlier the inverse square law you know you could even be like five miles from the detonation point and the radiation is going to be tremendously lower so that's something to keep in mind, you know, if, if you know that there's a bomb, let's say you're in downtown Manhattan, downtown uh, L.A., and, you, and there's a, a emergency alert system on the TV, and they're saying that Kim Jong-un launched a missile, and it's coming for L.A. or New York. If you're a good runner, you know, you may want to get the hell away from, from the city as far as, you you know, the missile's only, it's going to come in 30 minutes. You may be able to cover a few miles in that time, especially with an adrenaline rush. You know, you may want to just try to sprint away from the from the heart of the city where he would probably target it so you can get away from that fatal dose of radiation as well as the blast wave and the thermal radiation. But fallout, um, fallout is more widespread. It's going to cover a larger area, but it's not going to be as strong as the as the one near the detonation point. It's still going to make you sick, you know, but you're going to have to be out in the fallout for longer periods of time. Um, depending on how, how, you know, when, when you get caught out, you know, if you're caught like right after the fall, once the fallout is going to have the most radiation is like right when it's falling from the sky, you know, right after a couple of hours after the explosion is when the fallout is going to have the most radiation. And then from there on, it's going to degrade very quickly. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, for example, with the fallout when there was a Chernobyl incident, um, the area, like I said, the area right in the in the previous video, right near Chernobyl, um, you know, the area right where Chernobyl is had very high radiation levels, you know, and, and the workers that were working there, you know, that was the USSR, the, the, the government was telling them to put on, you know, like standard PPE, you know, gear that you would wear for like mopping a floor, thinking that it's going to protect them from radiation, and then, and they sent them into the reactor core and they were asking them to shovel nuclear material out from the core um and the, all those workers they were just they were basically suicide workers they weren't told that they were going to get a fatal dose uh the, you know the, the soviet union just used them as as tools to shovel the material out knowing that they would get fatal doses you know so even like you know 
And these guys would be shoveling material for like 30 minutes and they would rotate like every 30 minutes or so. Even that 30 minute rotation of shoveling, that gave them a fatal dose and most of them died within, you know, a few days or two weeks, you know. Um, but with the fallout, when we were talking about the Chernobyl situation, um, you know, the fallout spread all the way into further countries, even in, into Sweden, into Belarus, into the Baltics, into Poland, you know, other parts of Europe and Eastern Europe that are, you know, hundreds of miles away from Chernobyl. The fallout was able to spread that far because, like I said, it's ashes. And the ashes are carried by atmospheric winds. So, you know, the atmospheric winds are going to carry the ashes depending on how strong the winds are and the prevailing prevailing wind direction it's going to um it's, it can carry the ashes very far away so you know you got to keep that in mind you know you could you know you could even be like in Canada and if there's a bomb that goes off in DC or New York City it could still come up the fallout could still come up and affect you you know so uh that's something to keep in mind so that's why it's good to know you know these things and to be prepared for nuclear war and nuclear survival because even if Let's say there's like a, a situation where Kim Jong-un launch, launches a missile here in the U.S. The fallout could spread even if it's not in your city or in your immediate area. You could even live in like Montana or North Dakota, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, and the fallout can still spread, you know, from the West Coast. Let's say they hit like San Francisco or they hit L.A. or something. It can still, the, you know, the winds can still blow it towards you even if you're in the Black Hills, you know. You could be in the Black Hills of South Dakota and then the fallout could still hit you there. So you want to know your basic nuclear principles. The 710 rule and the inverse square law like I mentioned in a previous video. And then I'm going to go uh, in, in further videos. I'm going to go into uh, more details um, about how to protect yourself. So uh, I hope you enjoyed part 3. Alright guys, so in part 4... In part four of the nuclear attack survival skills series, I'm going to talk about uh, what you need to worry about if there's a nuclear attack and how to protect yourself. So join me in part four. Click on the bottom of the screen and uh, I'll see you over there. All right, guys. Take care.